Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. tell you something being in Mexico um, and just seeing the the destruction was just so uh, I mean you would go to one place like we get we got there and it's like oh you're just your heart you're just like man did anybody die in this place and actually that 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 house that you just saw right there was a miracle the mom the husband the little girl and the family all got out of the house it actually they decided to sleep on another side of the house that night right or something like that and uh, the side that they decided not to sleep in is the side that completely got crushed. And so, uh, but there were Christians, believers, and, and they love God. I, I, I truly believe that no matter how much destruction there is on this earth, I truly believe that when God says, I will protect you, he truly means it. No matter, no matter what, what comes our way, he protects us, and he's good like that. And uh, as you all know, I want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because Elevate Church responded like nobody's business. Let me tell you. So give yourselves a big hand, because let me tell you, what you guys did was phenomenal, phenomenal. And, uh, and we haven't stopped. Uh, today, another truck arrived with more food and, and stuff, and we're going to keep helping and, and, uh, and not just leave these people in place. But we want to just talk to you a little bit tonight of just what our experience was. But I have a, a meaning message to just kind of stir your heart because I'm sure that every single one of us have our own kind of storm, per se, in our life. And, uh, and I know that sometimes you can be like, man, I'm so selfish because I'm just thinking about my stuff. Well, you know what? I, you're, you're probably right, yeah. But at the same time, how many know that God cares about even your small junk? Aren't you glad that he cares? So it's not like, you know what? Oh, you jerk. Why is it that you're just thinking about you and all these people are dying? And No, God, care, God has grace, mercy, and tender, loving kindness for everyone. Right? And so I also don't want you to think that, that, that God doesn't care about your situation because, you know what, God is so busy taking, taking care of things in, in Mexico and, in, in, you know, Houston and Miami and, and all the different parts of the world that's just dealing with so much, you know, tra tragedy. God cares about every single person, but we'll talk about that in a minute. I just want to share with you, give, if you guys can just show the other two pictures real quick. This is another, another place that we saw. I mean... Just about everywhere we went was about, gosh, I'd say maybe 60, 70% of the communities that we went to were just completely just gone. People were sleeping on the streets because they lost their home. They, we, we interviewed. I have a lot of videos of just interviewing people, and they would just start talking and just weeping on how uh, their homes were passed down to them if anywhere from 100 years to 50 years to 40 years have the homes have been in their family. And I asked them, so what are you going to do to rebuild? And they all pretty much said the same thing. Well, we have, we have no money. We have nothing. But they all had hope. They all had hope. Shocking how much resilience the people of Mexico have. Shocking. We were chirp, chirping out, right? I mean, these people had so much resilience of their, them just saying, but we're going to rebuild again. But we're going to rebuild again. And then you had others that were completely just hopeless. But the majority in this community were Christians. And there should have been more dead people. There was about, uh, they're saying about 500 people dead. And just, and we, uh, Kuch, I, always, I always jack up the name, Kuchitan. 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 Has 150,000 people that live in, in just this community, 150,000. You know, but your heart breaks because you want to be able to feed everybody. Well, it's impossible to feed everybody. And so we would go to communities and people would be begging. Literally, I had this one lady saying, no one has brought me water. We have no water. We have no water. What do you do? You're just like, ah. No food, no water, and they're begging you, and you're just like, ah, oh, I have nothing else to give. And but but I I thank God by God's grace and mercy through you guys. I'm telling you, uh, you guys were able to help us bring five tons worth of food uh, to this community and and to feed people for about two weeks. And uh, so that's awesome for two weeks. And uh, and today another shipment came in, 
And then I'm going to prepare uh, uh, our church to send another trailer of stuff and uh, so that we can help. But, but beyond that, we need to, we need to give them some, some, some tools. Uh, we can't just keep giving them fish. We have to give them fishing poles soon. And, uh, and that's the next step. We, we did set up a, out of this, out of, the, out of the rubble, you know what came out of this? We set up a board now. We were able to get nine churches together to work together in, in, the, in the process of, of restoration and, and rebuilding. And now there's a total of 13 churches that are all come together. So we set a board in place of a, uh, you guys are familiar with the board. You got the president, the vice president, the treasurer, the, the, the administrator. Yeah, yeah. So we, and then we have advisors. And so we have a board for the purpose of making sure that integrity is always kept intact and that character is kept intact with all the pastors. And so this board is basically running the operations right now for us, which is awesome. And it's so cool because all the pastors, I did a vote of who should be the leader. And uh, because, you know, you you can't just go there and appoint. Anybody, who's this huero, white guy, looking Mexican, trying to appoint? They they probably thought all of it. This is local coming in here trying to. But I just said, hey, guys, we met. We all got together in a big huddle. And I said, okay, we need a leader. We can't have too many many chefs and not enough cooks. Amen. We can't have too many, uh, you know, cowboys and. And 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 uh, and whatever you get what I'm saying. I sound like I sound like Bush right now, huh? <laughs> so that happens when you're away for so long. You you know you're. I'm thinking Spanish now. I can't even talk in English. It's so hilarious. I'm try, I, I can't even try. I'm like try, I'm like trying to translate in Spanish. That's crazy. I don't know what's happening in my head. I need Jesus right now. But it's so true that um, that you need to appoint a leader in order to start making some, some God decisions. And I want you to know that as you guys have helped here, um, I want you to know that, that we have set up a system, a strategy to make sure that everyone who meets, to this hour while we're worshiping, I'm getting still my phone is being blown up. Why? Because part of the integrity is that they have to send me pictures of every single delivery in addition to every single pastor had, has to go out by twos. Two different churches by twos to look after each other to make sure that there's no funny business going on. You know what I'm saying? And it's been just working amazing. As a matter of fact, be praying for me now. Right now, I am working as we speak with Children's Hunger Fund. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, they're having me put a full proposal together to bring even more relief. And one of the questions that was really just threw me out, and I wasn't expecting that because they focus solely on food. But they're like, how much money do you need? I'm like, oh, my God, glory, glory to Jesus. That's what we need because we need to rebuild homes, right? And so um, be praying for God's divine favor and that God would give me wisdom on how to put the big proposal for uh, Oaxaca, Mexico for them in order for extra help and relief to come in and help them with the rebuilding of homes. And then I am super grateful and thankful for my really amazing friend. He's not only a leader here, but... Uh, Gus and his wife, Petty, are just amazing people. When I was going to go, I was going to go on my own, but then Gus is like, no, I'm going with you. And, uh, and let me tell you, Gus is a very busy man. He works a lot. He works in the movie industry, and he's always busy and uh, works like 17 hours a day, 14, something crazy. Sometimes he goes three days straight with no sleep, and he says, I'm going with you. And, and I said, dude, are you sure? He's like, yeah, I'm going with you. I'm not, I'm not letting you go alone. And uh, I'm so grateful uh, that you went with me. He's also our missions director, which, you know what, he should be going anyways, right? I'm like, <laughs> so thank you, but not. <laughs> thank you for doing your job, dude. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that he went with me because I needed some help out there. Uh, and let me tell you something. I, I, love that, I love to see his leadership. His leadership just, uh, just came out. I saw a whole other Gus that I've never seen before. And uh, let me tell you something, you find out the real you when you go through something. That's the good thing. So if anything good comes out of tragedy, is it exposes what's really on the inside of you. And, uh, and I want to say thank you for doing that. So I want you to share for just a, a few minutes, just talk to me. What was your experience like there? I'm sure the people want to hear about what you saw. They're, they're probably tired of hearing of me, but just share real quick. Just what, what's on your heart? Uh, the main thing that was on my heart, you kind of covered it already, was hope. Regard, you know, despite all the uh, the devastation that we saw, you know, all the loss, and everything that started tugging at my heart, I'm like, wow, look at this. There was always something that brought me hope, 
where there was the, the people rising up and saying, you know what, I'm not going to wait on anybody. I'm not waiting on the government. They're never going to show. There's a family that was there just, you know, they had already started cleaning up all the debris. When we showed up, bring them some food. Their house was completely crumbled, but their floor was swept. They had piles of, you know, material they were trying to salvage. And, and when I'm seeing that, you know, in the middle of all this chaos, they're like, no, you know what, we're going we're gonna to keep moving forward. This is not going to stop us. Uh, and everywhere we went, we were seeing that. And there was just so much hope. So much hope, as Pastor mentioned, uh, bringing the, uh, the local pastors together. That in itself, you know, we came out there looking. We came out there looking for miracle testimonies. <coughs> and me being kind of cynical and the experience I've had uh, in, in other missions experiences, where pastors are constantly bickering, churches are fighting with each other. But to see them come together, that was a miracle in itself. That was one of the biggest miracles to see them come together. There was no bickering. You know, who's going to be in charge when when they came to the vote to decide who was going to be leading the, the group? Everybody was in agreement. This man right here. And to see that to me was just was a miracle yeah. you know and seeing people in in the midst of all this like the chaos and just the confusion the fear to see them coming together as a community we uh one of the first areas we went to visit we saw a home it didn't look that bad it was some huge cracks but it didn't look that bad until we walked inside and you could see interior walls just collapsed uh the house next door was pretty bad also and it was cool we look out there I don't know how the houses are set up. You know, as Pastor mentioned, it, it gets passed down from generation to generation. You have kids, you know, your kids don't move out. They're just like, oh, there's an empty spot right there. Start building there. <laughs> they have kids. Oh, look, there's an empty <laughs> spot there. Build there. So it's just generation, on top, families. Of, on, top, generation on top of generation. And uh, so we're in this area, and we walk in. looks like a driveway, but it, it's a big open courtyard for the two houses. And they had they set up themselves a little uh, – little tarp city you know they had a tarp and they had their hammocks and, and that that was cool seeing that but then we went across the street to talk to another lady whose house came down and that house was like 100 years old it was like the third or fourth generation had been passed down and she's like i have nothing yeah and so you know pastor asked her well, you know what are you doing now where are you staying he's like well i'm across the street with them and just to see that that they're you know not just their family but they're bringing in their neighbors yeah Every community we went to, you'd see, you know, uh, these tarps spread across from trees or whatever they could, poles, whatever was still standing, and that's where people would come out. Um, one lady I, I spoke to, she said, you know, this is we're, – we're united in this. You know, all the women that you see out here right now, this isn't everybody. He's like, when you go into, you know, they said the, the interior, and what they meant by the interior is you see like a driveway on one of these streets. You walk down that driveway, and it's actually an alley. And you see another driveway that's an alley. And then another alley and another alley. It was like a maze going back there. And that's where the majority of the damage was in the, in the, the places in the back. But then all those people come out at night just uh, to be, a, you know, to have the safety in numbers. And just to see them, you know, welcoming. It doesn't matter what issues they may have had before with their neighbors. They were all there together. And, and, and you say safety because what happened while we were there, uh, children were starting to be abducted by traffickers. Um, so you have everybody, politicians are coming to try to buy the properties of the people that lost everything. You know why? Because they say, I can build a hotel here. I can build a restaurant here. And when people are desperate, people do desperate things. And uh, traffickers were stealing babies from, from the streets because people are sleeping on the streets. And you hear uh, um, uh, the people now arming themselves. I will say this. Prior to the earthquake, another great miracle Prior to the earthquake, Huchat Huchatan is one of the most uh, violent communities in Mexico. One of the most violent. We're talking anywhere from one to five murders per day for five straight years until the earthquake. Since the earthquake, zero murders. Zero murders. So they were like, man, you know what? If we can say anything good as we were, we'd be out at night with the pastors. Are like, well, if we can say anything good about this earthquake, and they're kind of laughing at it, and we're just like, wow, but it's pretty serious they said there hasn't been one murder since this earthquake and uh and it just really has brought a community together um when you go through something you need a church community you you need a church family you can't be the lone ranger the wanderer wandering around not having people that are going to help you and connect with you uh when you're going through something you need the body that's why jesus preached so much about the neighbors and uh and helping one another and being there for one another and praying for one another and encouraging one another 
and uh, it's it, it was a beautiful thing to see as we were walking by. Yeah, and it was it was a hassle for us trying to get uh, if we were out doing doing deliveries and it got dark and trying to get back to you know to the church where it was our base of operation because they were shutting down all the streets. Yeah. Not not the not the military, not the police, not the government, but the the, the residents, the people there. They took over. They were blocking all the streets and said, "Nope, nobody's coming through here." And you see patrols of men walking around with sticks and machetes. I don't know oh what yeah, I'm doing, and, and surprised that nobody has been killed. Yeah, or murdered, yeah, yeah. But they were they were patrolling their streets and protecting their families. Yeah. And just to see that was just it, yeah. it, it was an awesome thing. Yeah, it was an awesome thing. It was pretty wild. Um, and, and I can tell you this, and and this is what I want to talk. Do you have anything else? Uh, please keep going if you got some more stuff. Please. Just, like I said, everything that we saw that could have been a bad thing, I just kept seeing hope. And you know, you you pretty much stole all my thunder. You know, you brought up, you brought the youth up here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, when you I'm brought so the youth sorry. up here, because I was thinking, you know. <laughs> I'll give you all Sunday, okay? You just take over, Amy. <laughs> as, as I was reflecting on, you know, what, what had happened, if, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the picture or the video of uh, when we were separating the food. Yeah. If you look, who was there? It was just so much youth was there. You and I'm thinking, those are the ones. They were just, we're there. We're going to be there. We had about 90 volunteers. It was pretty I think awesome. It was a, a little more Probably than more that. than that? Yeah, because me being I'm who always I am, bad with numbers, yeah, man. But it's, who it's I am, I was complaining. People. I'm like, some of these people got to go. There's too many people. It's going to be chaos. <laughs> I know. There's going to be order. <laughs> Gus, we need half I talked to Gus. I'm like, I'm like, all right, Gus, so we got to use He's like, yeah, he's like, here's the first thing. He's like, some of these people got to go. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> they all got to stay, Gus. <laughs> you know what? No one is leaving. <laughs> uh, praise God, we were able to get, you know, we were able to get some kind of order established and things. He's very detailed. That's why. Things went smooth. Things went smooth. Yeah. But that was a. That was a good thing. Um, like I said, there was just so many things that just came out of there. But everything that I saw and all the destruction was like, should I be a little more moved? But I couldn't because I just saw so much hope and potential in yeah. everything that we were doing. And, you know, I went with the desire. You know, we didn't know what to expect. We were going, you know, we didn't know if we were going to actually have to be in the rubble, you know, just yeah. trying to, you know, trying to get people out. We didn't, we didn't know what to expect. You know, the whole drive, I'm like, Pastor, we're going to stop. We need to get shovels. We need to get wheelbarrows. We need to get stuff. He's like, let's just get there and figure it out. Yeah. And uh, we didn't know what to expect. I just knew that I was going, and I was like, Lord, just use me, stretch me. You know, regardless of what I do, I don't think it's enough. You know, I don't want to be comfortable with what we're doing. And when we when we were there, like I said, the one thing I just I have a tendency of not stepping up to the, my calling and just kind of sitting back, being a I don't even, I don't even want to say it, being a passive leader. I just kind of like to stay. I'll do whatever's asked of me. I just don't want to be in the forefront. I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be up here right now. I would just rather be out. I'd rather be back over there doing whatever. But I knew that there wasn't wisdom in that. And then just following the example that Pastor was setting, we can't, uh, I can't be tied up with my hands on things and, we're not, and I can't see the big picture. And that's the one thing where the Lord was really stretching me is like take a step back. You know, I want to be hands-on. I love being hands-on because that's easy for me. But to actually step back and to bring some direction to some of the pastors there, because they they were doing the same thing. They were all heart, and they weren't they were getting involved, but they weren't directing their their people, and that was, was going to lead to the chaos. And to me, that was a beautiful thing where just the Lord was able to use me and stretch me and say, "No, you need to step back and actually use the giftings that you've been you know that I've given you." And like I said, and this is something that pastor's been he said he saw a different person, but I don't think that's completely the case because he's seen something in me years ago that has brought me to the place where I'm at. And then as we continued in the trip, meeting with other people that these were people of influence and they're saying, look, you know, we're thinking we're going to go, we'll rebuild some houses. And they're like, no, we're not going to stop there. We want to, we want to have like production lines where they're going to, we're going to start building, getting the material and people can come here and we can start prefabbing houses. We can start prefabbing different things. Uh, we're going to rebuild the economy. You know, we were thinking, we were going there to help, and we're going to be, you know, we're, we're thinking small. But some of these people were just opening our eyes to other things that, you know what, there's so much more that we can do. And for me, it was intimidating. Uh, when we met with these people. The senator's sister. Yeah. And we went, you know, I go to my usual spot, <coughs> the far end of the table. You know, <laughs> I'm like, when they need me, they'll let me know. I'll go run, get whatever. And Pastor's like, hey, come over here. I need you to sit over here. And it was intimidating to me. I'm like, man, I'm sitting at the big boy's table. You know, and I, I'm like, why? I'm thinking, why like, am Gus, I? Gus, why are you with the kids? Get over here, man. What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> Crazy. Get, that, that's so where I, put, I was with the kids. So I put him at the head table. <laughs> and, you know, and it was, and the whole time I'm there, and this guy's talking, I'm like, oh, 
man, I, you're talking about building communities and building, I'm like, I built a house, man. I go down, you know, to These Mexico. people build homes in Africa. Yeah. And it was, so it, it was kind of intimidating, but the whole time I felt the Lord saying, hey, this is what I've called you for. And as, as pastors always said, if, if we're, we're pursuing a vision that we can handle in our own strength, it's not from God. And that's just what kept resonating in my head. I'm like, how am I ever going to do something like this? You know, I do little things. You know, and this guy's talking about something huge. And that was, that, you know, it, it brought hope to see that there were people thinking like that and expanding our minds and our thinking. But it was also, you know what? I don't know how, Lord, but you're going to make this happen. All I'm going to do is just take the steps that you're asking yeah. me to take. And, you know, I, I'm feeling really good. I'm excited. Uh, there was some talk of us going back again this year. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it, and it's like whatever, whatever it takes, and whatever is asked of me, I'm, I'm there to do it. And awesome, thank you, Gus. Thank you so much. You can take your seat. Thank you so much. Um, and Patty, thank you for for allowing your husband to be with me for that for that long. I really appreciate that. And babe, thank you so much for letting me go, and for allowing us to be over there. And I know that's that's a lot because then she's got to take care of the church. And uh, but I heard she did an amazing job on Sunday. So thank you so much. Awesome. He said something, God wants to expand you, God wants to stretch you. Uh, I want to read a, a quick verse and then let's get out of here, okay? Real quick. Sorry, it's an hour 15 Wednesday, so let's do this thing. Hebrews 6 on the screen, look at this. It says, people take oaths. You guys got the right version? People promise things. Wow, that's different. Okay, let me read you my version. <laughs> people take oaths by someone greater than themselves. For example... I swear on my grandma. You ever swear on your grandma? Don't lie in church. I swear on my grandma. Man, I swear. My, my, why do grandmas always have to pay the price, right? So, so check this out. So check this out. So we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Many scholars think it was Paul. Others think it was some other disciple. But I, I don't know. It, it could be Paul. Paul was a great encourager. But it says here, people take oaths by someone greater than themselves. An oath makes a promise. An oath makes a what? Promise. Certain. It puts an end to all arguing. So God took an oath when he made his promise. Let's keep going quickly because I can get out of here. He wanted to make it very clear that his purpose does not change. No matter what you've been through, God's purpose does not change. No matter what health issue, financial issue, family issue, no matter what tragedy you've experienced, his promise does not change. Why? Because there's man oath and then there's God oath. And God's oath is certain. Let's keep reading. He wanted to make it clear that his purpose does not change. He wanted those who would receive what was promised to know that. Like Abraham. Old guy. God said, you're, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be a father of many nations. However, he had no kids. You can't have nations without a child, can you? And, and God made a promise to him. And we know that the promise was probably about when he was I don't know, probably 75 years old is when God spoke to him. And he had the child at about 99 years old. So just think about how many years it took for that, that promise. But when God makes a promise, it's a promise. When God makes an oath, it's a promise. And so God took an oath so we would have good reason. Everybody say good reason. So, so God took an oath so that we would have good reason not to give up. We have run away from everything else to take hold of the hope offered to us in God's promise. So God gave his promise and his oath. Those two things can't change. Those two things can't change. God can't change his promise and God can't change his oath. Those two things God cannot change. He couldn't lie about them. Our hope is certain. It is something for the soul Check this out. It is something for the soul to hold on to. It is strong and it is secure. It goes all the way into the most holy room behind the curtain. That is where Jesus has gone. He went there to open the way ahead of us. He has become 
a high priest forever, just like Melchizedek. Let me tell you something. I can't and you can't control what happens to you and me. You can't. We can't control the fact that there was an earthquake in Oaxaca. There was an earthquake in Puebla, Mexico City. We can't control that there's been hurricanes right now. Hurricane Jose and Martha uh, or Maria, whatever the name is. <laughs> you can't control it. But I know one thing. I couldn't control when, 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 when this mass came to attack my body. I couldn't control it. I couldn't control that I had to have an open heart surgery procedure in order to remove this 10 by 10 inch mat. I couldn't control it. But one thing that I knew is that I had an anchor in him. That's, that's the only thing I know. You see, that's what he's saying. He's saying, Mauricio, I have made an oath. I have made a promise that you will live and not die and you will declare all the works of the Lord. I have made a promise that, that you will pastor, you will preach, you will teach, you will, you will go into nations. Now, mind you, this is before we've done any of what we're doing here at Elevate Church. That's, God was always telling me that when I was just two years of being a Christian. He would prophesy over me. Men would come or women and they would speak a word like, you're going to pastor a church. I'm like, no, I'm not. What's wrong with you? You're crazy. I'm going to pastor I'd walk back to myself like, babe, they're crazy, man. Pastor, yeah. Right? You're going to travel the world. Man, I can barely pay the rent. <laughs> what you talking about, man? What are you saying, dude? <laughs> Dang, I'm just trying to get a raise at work. You know? I'm just trying to get some love. We tra travel the world. And then now here we are traveling the world. Africa next year, Japan next year. When God makes a promise, he can't change it. When God makes an oath, he doesn't lie. No matter what you're facing right now, maybe right now your health is not the greatest. His promise is health and healing to all your flesh. Maybe right now, you know what? You, you have a business that's just jacked up, messed up. If God called you to the, the marketplace ministry, there's a promise. If your family is messed up, God is a God who says, I bring restoration, I bring transformation. That is a promise. He made an oath that I will reconcile families. I will reconcile relationships. I will reconcile children back to their mother, their fathers. But most importantly, I'll reconcile the world back to the Father. That's a promise. It's an oath. God does not lie. We all make, we all make oaths on someone greater than ourselves. But let me tell you something. I remember making promises that I never fulfilled. But God makes a vow that he never changes. Isn't God good? I want to bring you this message tonight as we close right now is because I need you to understand that we talk a lot about faith, but we don't talk much about hope. You see, hope is simply this. If you guys can put my points up there quickly, just put them all up there. Just, okay, hope, look at this. Hope is my what? Assurance. Did he say, did he say that, hey, you can have this certainty in this oath. So hope is my assurance. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the assurance. I'm going to make you certain that what I say, I do. That's hope. You can't even have faith without hope. You see, hope is what gives birth to faith. Faith then becomes my action. First I got hope that he who promised is faithful. Now my faith goes into action and I have to go start doing what I can do. Like when Gus, Gus, Gus is so detailed. What are we going to do? What, what about, I'm like, Gus, I don't know. I haven't got there yet. But when we get there, we're going to figure it out. I love that about him. You know why? Because in all reality, Gus was operating in hope. Here's my definition of hope. This is what you were doing, Gus. Let me define this for you. My definition for hope, guys, come on, quick. Hope is a constant. Never say constant. Oh, he was constant helping me, Jesus. Is a constant expectation that God is working even when I can't sense him. That's hope. He was constant, constantly, 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 constantly. Hope. 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 If today's message impacted you in any way, 
and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.